Welcome to Encounter Wargaming, I'm Jay, and today I'm going to be showing you how we're going to make these cool little post-apocalyptic buildings. Alright, so I had a friend of mine, Raf is his name, uh, he actually works at the Sword and Board in Toronto, so if you're in Toronto, check out that store, it's an awesome gaming store, they have a great gaming space. Uh, it's where Hogtown 40k plays on a regular basis, so anyway, regardless, that plug aside. Uh, he approached me to do a commission for a table um, for a game called This Is Not A Test. So I don't know if you guys have heard of this before, but I think it's basically like a zombie apocalypse uh, future. And he told me he really wanted to go sort of Fallout uh, theme with it, but at the same time, we're keeping it very basic, sort of modern day, uh, blown out city, basically right? Post-apocalyptic, but sort of modern aesthetic, not 40k aesthetic or fantasy aesthetic as I'm used to doing. Uh, so anyway, I've cooked up these little buildings for them. Now this is not the building entirely complete. I am actually going to add signs and posters and random things around to make these look a little more realistic, lived in, weathered, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and I'm going to show you how to do that in future videos, but right now, for today, we're going to basically go through how to build this right from scratch, uh, all the materials, all the tools you'll need uh, to get the job done, and I'll show you how I did it, and hopefully you guys can make some awesome terrain of your own for your own various post-apocalyptic 28mm games that you play, or even just 40k. Um, I've made all of these pieces modular, so as you can see, the layers come off, so the model can be placed inside, same with the roof. Um, and of course I'm doing an entire city of these, so the one I'm showing you here is just the small one, in fact I'm going to show you the small one for the course of this tutorial, and then uh, I'll show you all of the city complete once it's entirely finished. So without further ado, let's get into building these things. So we're going to start with our sheets of foam core, and for this I've decided to do each story about three inches tall, mainly because that's sort of, you know, the, I want to say standard hobby standard for a 28 millimeter scale. Now that standard was probably set by Games Workshop. The guy I'm doing this commission for, he wants to be able to use it for 40k as well as this is not a test, with this is not a test being the, the end, like the actual purpose of this, right? So I just cut out some three inch strips and then I'm measuring out how wide I'm gonna make the walls. So in the case of the small buildings, they're actually gonna be six inches by six inches. Um, the medium-sized ones are, will be 8 by 8s and the large ones will be 12s by 12s which will mean cutting a lot of windows, but it's all good. This is how it is. So, I'm just measuring them out and I'm just going to cut them out, basically just cutting the strips into smaller pieces. Now, if you've noticed, I measured from the outside of each strip. Uh, this is to maintain the factory edge, which is going to be a lot straighter than any cut I can make, even if I'm precise with it. So. In order to have the most clean edges, I'm going to measure from the outside and then basically cut out the middles of each strip. And now it's time to measure out all my windows. So um, I've decided to make the windows an inch by an inch. I measured an inch and a half in from the edge of each piece and then in one inch increments from there, being one inch from the bottom and one inch from the top as well, and then just drawing a grid onto the surface of each facing. And just do this like a million times until you've drawn out all your squares. And then basically uh, we're going to start cutting them out. So now that I've got everything drawn out, I'm basically going to just take my knife and cut them all out. Just be patient, take your time. Uh, when you are cutting them out, make sure to go a little bit past your line. Uh, as far I mean like a little bit outside your square. Because that way you'll have less ripping um, like the bristol board part of it wants to rip uh, and don't worry about causing extra cracks throughout the walls like by making your knife blade go past those squares because I'll show you later how to cover that. So then I'm going to go on to cut out basically the floors and ceilings of these things. So I'm going to need, since I want this to be two story, I'm going to need a floor for the bottom, a floor for the upper floor and then one to be the push in roof. Now, I'm making sure to make, like I said, these were six by six. I wanna make the one direction, since it's already at six, I wanna make it 
a centimeter less because I'm using five millimeter foam core. So one direction is going to be exactly six inches and the other direction is going to be a centimeter less six inches. And that way we'll be able to put the wall pieces on and they'll stay flush with each other with no gaps in between. Uh, I hope that is clear and not confusing. So now that I've got all my pieces cut out, I'm just taking my hot glue gun and gluing everything together. Like I say, you want one, the front and back walls to actually overhang the side walls being flush at the outside. Um, that's why we made the one direction on these base squares uh, a centimeter less so that we could overlap the foam uh, and keep it nice flush outside on them. And just keep going till they're all built. I'm blind between your stars. So now that my buildings are all put together, I'm going to cut a bunch of popsicle sticks. A, to cover the exposed foam on the edges of where I connected them, like that flush side I was telling you about. Um, this is so that you don't see the exposed foam core. We want this to look very consistent. But also, because I want these floors to be able to sit on top of each other and fit inside the one below it, since they are the same width, I'm going to build popsicle sticks around the outside, overlapping the floor above. Does that make sense? So I'm basically gluing on half the popsicle stick onto the actual piece, and then the other half just sticks up above it, so that the floor above it can fit inside. And I'm just cutting them to size, kind of going from one side to the other. Uh, that way, if there is a little bit of inconsistency with my sides, uh, I'm not, I don't have a popsicle stick that's too short or too long for the space provided. I actually eye it up, draw it out, and cut it. And then I'm just cutting smaller ones and gluing them on to the edges of the foam core, like I said, to cover them up uh, on just the four edges, of course, just to cover up the foam. And then I'm going to start cutting little tiny pieces. Since I decided to do the windows one inch wide, I'm going to make these an inch and a half. And that way it'll come out a little bit further than the window, make it look, you know, a little more realistic, but also cover some of those knife marks. I, I told you to go beyond the square. This way these will cover at least the two ones that are below the window uh, and add quite a bit of strength. But then the ones that they don't cover, we're going to have to go around and fill with spackle. And that's what we're doing now. Uh, I'm also making sure to fill any gaps between popsicle sticks where I have the popsicle sticks meet each other, especially on the corners. Um, and like I say, I'm filling up the knife gouges in the surface of my piece with the spackle around the windows there. And then in fact, it'll also help if you take some spackle and put it along the exposed foam on the inside of the windows, since we don't want to be building a window frame inside. We just want to fill the pores of the foam, uh, just to add stability, um, and also to make it look more like a smooth surface rather than foam core, right? And uh, once all that's done, we're basically just going to take some sandpaper and start sanding them. So anywhere I, on all the corners of the windows where I put the spackle, anywhere I connected popsicle sticks, like I say, and filled that little crack between popsicle sticks, I want to sand everything flat. Don't worry if you keep some of the spackle on there. It's fine as long as the surface is flat because we're going to be putting textured paint over top of this and then, of course, actual paint on top of that. And then I'm just taking an X-Acto blade because I filled the, like I said, exposed foam on the edges, on the inside edges of the windows. I'm just taking an X-Acto knife and chiseling out the corners so that they do actually maintain a square shape as opposed to be rounded in the corners because that will happen as your spackle settles. And then once all that's done, I'm basically just putting some PVA glue on the again the exposed foam core edges just to make sure that they're fully sealed in and that they're nice and sturdy there's no fragility there um like i said i filled it with a spackle but again the spackle kind of chips out a little bit and it doesn't quite hold in very well also where i have the half popsicle stick kind of sticking over the top i uh want to make sure that i put lots of pva there not only to seal in the exposed foam but also to make sure there's a tight bond between the popsicle stick and the foam core 
there's only half the stick glued on with hot glue so it's very likely to break off but by throwing in that layer of PVA glue you make sure everything stays sealed and uh, as I've said before in past videos white glue is basically wood glue it's more or less the same thing it will interact with the popsicle stick and it will um, soak into the foam core nicely adhering the two to each other and making them very strong so when you're pulling in and out that upper floor uh, you're not going to break off your popsicle sticks. So now that we've done all our sanding and we've done all our extra PVA glue just to seal everything in, I'm just going to take my playground sand, which I usually use for basing, and I'm actually going to sieve it a bit. I'm going to put it through a strainer so that only the fine sand uh, I end up using for the textured paint. And the larger stuff we'll save for future uh, tutorials you'll see in this series. So we will be using it, but right now I just want to use the fine sand to create my textured paint because I don't want large pebbles and things. So all I'm doing is mixing a bunch of sand, PVA glue. Um, I actually decided to throw a little bit of rust paint in this time just for the heck of it. And I just keep adding water, PVA glue, more sand until I feel it's the right consistency. And you kind of want that not quite melted ice cream. Uh, texture to it so it kind of drips off the popsicle stick but it's not too molassesy is that even a word um, but also runny enough and like I say uh, congealed enough that it's not going to run off your piece but you want to be able to spread it quite easily and then I'm just painting every single outside surface with this and what this will do is once it's painted it'll create the illusion of concrete so that's going to take a little bit to dry, so I've decided to make some of my other details here. So I've got here just some Sculpey 3. It's the oven activated stuff. Um, the only reason I'm using it is because I have it. I don't, I mean, I could recommend it for this kind of thing, but there are better things to use. But basically, I just want to put these steel doors around the terrain piece, um, and I only have one of them, so I want to make copies, basically. And all I'm doing for that is I'm just going to take a glob of this Sculpey, I'm going to take some, I've got some olive oil here. You can use any kind of oil, uh, bike grease or, you know, like bike chain grease or like anything like that. Uh, olive oil is just in every, or vegetable oil is in every household, so it's super easy to use. And I just paint the door with it and then take the glob of Sculpey and literally press down. Because I know one side of the door is not going to be seen once I glue it onto the piece. So I'm not worried about the back side, but I just want to press over top of it and create an impression of the door in the Sculpey. And then it's basically just a matter of flattening it out and putting it in the oven for about 15 minutes. And now I'm going to take a little more Sculpey and I'm just going to put a little more oil in my mold and press a glob of Sculpey into my mold. Peel it out as carefully as possible and then just make sure to flatten it back out on, on your flat surface. And I'm just doing a whole bunch of these. Uh, I have a feeling that some of them won't turn out very well, but some of them will. So I want to make more than I actually need. Uh, and it's just a matter of making a whole bunch of them and then putting them in the oven for, like I say, about 15 minutes. And then once they're done, I'm just going to take a chisel and chisel off all the extra flash uh, from, you know, squeeze out from when I push them into the original mold. And just clean up all the edges. So aside from our big steel doors, I actually want to create the look of shops on the fronts of these buildings. So for that, we're going to use corrugated cardboard. And you know how in a retail store, when it's closed, they pull down that, like, metal sort of garage door thing over top of the windows and over top of the front door to prevent theft. That's what we're trying to simulate here. So for that, I'm just cutting a bunch of like door and window shapes, uh, sort of the size I feel um, the front of a store would be on the building this size, as well as the sort of front door. And then I'm just cutting squares those sizes out of uh, corrugated cardboard. And it was different for each building. Um, but basically, in order to make them look like that steel garage door type th material, I actually want to peel one layer of the corrugated off, the front layer. And for that, we actually want to go against the um, glue seams. I don't know how else to say that. Um, don't rip along the same direction as the, what I want to call them, ribs in the corrugated cardboard, the corrugations, I guess. You want to pull the opposite direction the corrugations are going, if that makes sense at all. And that way, by pulling each one off one at a time, in a very abrupt manner like that, you're less likely to get that layer of paper that's going to stick behind because it's glued 
at more than one point, it's more likely to stick, if that makes any sense. Um, and yeah, that just limits the amount of, like, sort of tear off. And this way, it's a hell of a lot. Like, you can buy corrugated uh, Bristol board like this without the second layer on it, already corrugated to create that texture, but this is a lot cheaper. And then it's just a matter of super gluing them on where I want them. And I've decided to use super glue since the sand is very porous. Um, and white glue takes a while to dry. This way I can just stick them on instantly and it'll soak into the sand real good and create a nice tight bond. And then, of course, my molded doors that I won't plan to use for the back doors, I want to stick on. And then I've noticed it sticks out a little too far. So I'm actually going to take some popsicle sticks and just build a frame around the door. Just to sort of hide the sides of my sort of mismolding of the door. Uh, since it is kind of a, you know, mediocre recast of the door. And uh, just to make it look a little nicer. Of course, the doors are a little bit ripply because, like, I you know, I had some trouble making the Sculpey perfectly flat before I put it in the oven. But uh, that's okay, because this is an apocalypse, right? We want these doors to look beaten and rusted and what have you. So uh, we're just going to roll with it. And then uh, once all that's done, I'm going to take my black rust paint and just soak the entire thing in black rust paint, inside and out. Make sure to get... Uh, the inside edges of all those windows put a nice thick coat on guys don't be afraid just don't glob it on so that it runs you want to basically stab the piece um, with your brush and that will not only create a bit of a texture on your inside where you haven't put textured paint but it'll also help it get in between all of the little grains of sand on the outside and make sure that 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 there is no other colors other than black showing so that now that it's dry, I can just dry brush some, some gray on top. In fact, overbrush is probably a better way to put it. A very, very heavy dry brush of gray on the entire thing inside and out once again. Um, and that'll just create that concrete look that we want in an urban building. And then uh, before I do my final highlight, I'm just going to take some terrain washes. Now, I call these terrain washes because they're just paint and water. They're not quite as advanced as, you know, GW's washes. And you can see the dollar store paints I have there on the side. That's basically all it is, Crafters Acrylic. You know, I got it at the Dollarama. Mix in a little bit of water, and I'm using two or three different shades of green. Just going around in random spots, kind of creating splotches and water damage, water stains and things like that. Um, but, as you can see once it's dry, it's pretty drastic against the gray. Like, it's pretty... Uh, it contrasts with the gray, which is what we want because we want it to stand out, but at the same time, we don't want it to be too too visible, too apparent. Otherwise, it doesn't look realistic. So just to finish it off, like we usually do, I'm just taking a light bone color and doing a very light dry brush everywhere, again, inside and out. And you should be still be able to see your washes through that final layer, but it just ties every color in the piece together and creates that final shading. And then our next step, now that we have the basic color on the building, is of course to paint our, like, I don't, again, I don't know what to call it, a garage door type thing, uh, with a silver. And again, I'm just using a dollar store paint, nothing crazy. Uh, this one's actually called Silver Morning, which is very nice. But uh, any silver paint will work. And don't worry about using the cheap stuff, because we're going to be putting washes and stuff over top of this anyway. And that's exactly the next step once the silver is dry. I'm just gonna, I'm actually gonna take some Agrax Earthshade. Again, you can use a terrain wash, which would just be, I guess, a burnt umber with water. In this case, I wanted to use this, uh, the actual professional stuff, because I only have a few details here and there to paint with it. And uh, that way, since it is the final step, uh, I won't have to really dry brush any other colors on top of this at all right now and it'll just dry and make it look nice and weathered and water damaged and that's basically the whole building I hope you all enjoyed that tutorial that was a lot of fun for me like i say it was a commission for a friend so you won't be seeing these very much on the channel in the future but maybe i can get them to uh, show me how to play this is not a test once i finally get them these pieces of terrain um, so like i said this is just the building and painting of these buildings uh, i'm going to do another tutorial probably next time on how to do the signs. I'm going to put store signage as well as, of course, there's a back alley involved, right? So we're going to have posters and various things. 
uh, paste it to the wall just to make it look you know a little more interesting have make it a little more fun rather than just you know plain concrete even though we have done you know all the weathering and highlights and what have you uh, it's still very plain looking and I want this to look like a modern day city right with sort of a fallout theme so that's the uh, the aim of the next step in this series so I hope you guys are enjoying this so far like I say there's gonna be a whole bunch more videos to come out in this series because I am building an entire table here for this guy so uh, yeah that being what it is uh, if you enjoyed this video hit subscribe hit that like button because that goes a long way to help us here get up in the search engines and stuff like that plus if you hit subscribe you get to see when all our new content comes out. So we'll continue on with this series. I do a whole bunch of other terrain tutorials and stuff on the channel. And that's not all we do. We also do battle reports, hobby tutorials. We have a podcast. There's a whole bunch of stuff that we do. And we love every minute of it. So I hope you guys are loving every minute of it too. Also, if you want to support us a little bit, go to the link below and check out either our Spreadshirt page where you can get one of our Encounter Wargaming t-shirts or hell, you can have it printed on anything really, even a tote bag or a... Um, or a baby onesie if you really wanted to and uh, a little bit of money goes to help us there and then uh, also check out our patreon campaign it's in the description below um, and basically for as little as a dollar you can get a whole bunch more of our content plus this content early so as well as a whole bunch of other perks so check it out um, and other than that we'll see you at our next encounter hey everybody I'm Adam and I'm Jay we are encounter wargaming and we wanted to celebrate hitting our 1,500 subscribers with giving some stuff away. What are we giving away, Adam? Fort Bang! Yeah. All right, we're calling this the 2,500 subscriber Forge Bang giveaway because that's the target we need to hit to give this puppy away. That's right. So the first thing you need to do is share this video, the video you are watching right now. And then... Click subscribe on YouTube. If you haven't already. That's it for one entry. And the more you share it, hopefully, the more people we can get to hit subscribe and hit that 2,500. Woohoo! But there are other ways to win as well. Talk about it. it. Well, you can follow us on Twitch. That will also get you an entry. So you subscribe on YouTube, follow us on Twitch. On top of that, support us on Patreon for five big buckaroo entries. Crazy. So, also all the people that already support us on Patreon, don't worry, you're also five entries. But also, you can hit subscribe on Twitch. Subscribing on Twitch will get you another five entries into the contest. So good, and all of this to say thank you guys for all the support. We appreciate it very much. We've come a long way, and it's because of you. It's true. It's been a wild ride, and thanks for all the support, all the help. And we want to give, a, give you some cool stuff as a thank you. Awesome. So, hey, remember to share this video. And uh, guys, I think that's it. So we'll see you at our next encounter. Like a monkey in a rocket on his way back home.